Hey everyone, welcome to week eight of the semester. I'm Professor Rios, hope you're doing well. Uh, this week we're moving on to a different unit and that includes this lesson on biogeography and soils. So this, it's a rather small unit, really only two weeks like last unit, which is climate, climate classification and climate change. So this one includes biogeography and next week we'll get into biomes and that kind of stuff. So the objectives for the lesson, understanding the human factors on natural ecosystems, what the difference between porosity and permeability are, or is rather, the five factors in soil formation, the four processes of soil formation, and the basic properties and components of soil. So defining biogeography is rather simple. Uh, it's, it deals with both plants and animals, although in this class we're going to focus entirely on plants. So it's the study of the distribution patterns of them. So when you hear the word desert or forest or tropical forest or savanna or grassland, that's what I'm talking about. Biogeography is the totality of plants and animals in an area. Again, we'll concentrate on the plant portion in this course. So the human impact is undeniable. Uh, human population is probably a little bit higher than 7.5 billion already, but that is how human population has evolved with the first billion sometime around the early 1800s. And there you see the year for every billion more, so 1927 all the way to 2011, when the seventh billion human was born. Uh, we're headed to 8 billion roughly in the year 20, 2028, maybe? We'll see. Uh, but in any event, that population J curve, as it is called, uh, there's an influence on all kinds of, you know, you know, is influenced rather by urbanization and transportation, pollution, and all that kind of stuff. So the human impact is undeniable. It's the alteration of those natural ecosystems. So you've heard, you hear the word biodiversity quite a bit thrown out there. Biogeography, which we talked about, conservation and global carbon cycle. Okay. And um, it, it's definitely one of those things that it sort of repeats itself in the next couple of lessons, and that's on purpose just to highlight the points across. So there are four divisions in the environment and we've addressed already the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, the ocean and weather systems. We are addressing the biosphere now and then the next big final portion of the course will deal with the lithosphere, which is basically the crust the continents, land masses, that kind of thing. So these are the four broad divisions, which, although they seem unique and separate, are inextricably linked to one another. So the biosphere, the living organisms of Earth, again, you have to think of it as having strong points and weak points. So weak points, not surprisingly, deserts and the polar regions. And strong points, again, not surprisingly, we're talking about tropical rainforest. So, you know, this is the biosphere is that area where, where we live. We live in the biosphere. The atmosphere is, of course, enveloping us. The hydrosphere is something that provides moisture to the atmosphere. Uh, in life sustaining resources like fish and all that, but we are sort of in that interface between the atmosphere and the hydrosphere and in the biosphere is where all this stuff happens. Okay. So let's look at something like vegetation patterns and climate. So you can think of two different places, Charleston, South Carolina. 
and Yuma, Arizona. Both are roughly around the same latitude, yet they have very different precipitation and temperature patterns as a result of where they are. Think back to the lesson on climate um, controllers. And in this case, for Yuma, Arizona, it's far away from water, and even the water that is near it is relatively cold. Okay. Whereas Charleston, South Carolina has a warm Gulf of Mexico and a warm Atlantic Ocean. And right here is where the uh, Gulf Stream sort of cuts through. So as a result, it has a much more lush and green and vegetated uh, landscape. So you think about the idea of significant factors, photo period, temperature, moisture, what is the slope of the land? What is the soil type? What about nutrient load? And that means, think about our forests here in New York. They drop their leaves all the time. Those leaves decompose over winter and spring, and they eventually turn into soil. If you're in an area like the desert, like the Great Basin out west, or the Mojave Desert, or the Sonoran Desert of Mexico, you may have enough light and it may be warm enough, but you lack moisture and you lack nutrient load. The human activity, well, that kind of comes in sort of in behind it. And think about in California, how they turn the desert into a big giant agricultural machine as a function of artificially bringing in moisture in the form of water from the Colorado River. So conservation is the careful management of natural resources to achieve social and environmental results that are desired, okay? And they stem from lessons learned back in the 1930s when the Dust Bowl affected what we now call Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, that whole region of the United States. Uh, here's the idea of conservation, two countries with two separately, two very different approaches to their forests. That's Haiti on the left, that's the Dominican Republic on the right. And as you can see, same climate, but there's a lot more deforestation going on in Haiti. And as a result, that shows in how much soil is lost and how little vegetation is seen on one side compared to the other. Here's the idea of vegetation. This happens to be uh, in Africa. Uh, and there you see if the land isn't properly taken care of and the vegetation is lost, the soil can then be very easily exposed and lost when heavy rains come. And that seems like an overly simplistic thing to say, but in the end, it is that simple, okay? Here's another example of severe soil uh, degradation. Again, this is an area that should be a tropical rainforest. So these hills that you see here, this is Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar is should mostly be tropical rainforest, but when you basically deforest all the land, then the heavy rains that do fall can lead to severe soil loss, which is really obvious in that image there on the left. This is another example of Madagascar looking at an image from space. And from that perspective, it almost looks like the, the island is bleeding soil. So these beaches should be like this color. They should be beautiful, pristine, clear water. This is the tropics. But as a result of all the deforestation and all the exposed soil, when it rains heavy, and this is an A climate, it can scour away a lot of soil and that eventually finds its way into the oceans and the oceans or the beaches look like chocolate milk. 
Here is an image of where soil erosion is most severe. Notice we are definitely not um, immune to that here in the United States. In fact, every continent to some extent uh, is a victim to some form of soil erosion, whether it's low risk, all the way to very high risk. So the carbon cycle, the most fundamental process, basically there is in terms of life besides the water hydrologic cycle. It is the transfer of carbon from uh, carbon dioxide to living matter. So there's a continual exchange that takes place. Living matter to carbon dioxide when there's decomposition taking place. And then you repeat this over and over and over again. Okay, so this image here, you don't have to remember the numbers just to give you a sense of what the carbon cycle is like. It is not unlike the hydrological cycle. Sometimes carbon can be stored in the soils, uh, in the earth crust, it can be dumped into the oceans. Uh, it becomes part of the plant biomass, which is why carbon dioxide is typically lower during summer because there are more trees that are taking up co2 and turning it into food in winter when all the leaves fall then there are fewer leaves to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and as a result co2 numbers increase think back to that keeling curve carbon dioxide image that i showed last week So what is soil? Well, soil is mineral, mostly inorganic. There's a little bit of organic material and air. And of course, depending on rainfall, water. So soil is usually layered, you know, the, the deeper you go into the ground, the more mineral or inorganic it becomes. The further up you go, the more twigs and leaves and whatever else might be available, okay? So when you look at this image right here, showing you in millimeters of depth, you can see how this layer here is richer, it's darker, there is more nutrition here. As you go further and further down, notice how it's almost uniform there is less nutrition here. These plants are primarily taking advantage of the nutrition at the very, very top. So here's the idea of soil and bedrock. So bedrock is, of course, almost entirely inorganic. And there's always this sort of seeping in so these are some of the terms, eluviation, the fine particles carried by percolating water to a deeper soil, and the eyeluviation with an eye, the deposition of those particles that were brought down from above. So factors in the formation of soil, there are five. Climate, organisms, topography, the parent material or the rock, and you need a lot of time. So think of it as, um, as a way of COTPT. I know it's hard to remember, but climate is at the very top. Climate has a big influence on the type of soil that you have. Um, and I'll show you a couple of images here to hopefully show that. So look at this image here. This is the Sahel of Central Africa. Notice the soils are very dry. Oops, sorry. The soils are very sort of light in color. There's a lot of evaporation taking place, and there is very little in the way of organic material. And as a result, the soils are a bit salty. Now, Look at a place like the 
highlands of the tropical jungles in Peru or Brazil, then you have, of course, a different climate, an A climate, tropical climate. Uh, and this tropical climate uh, fosters, you know, a richer exchange of nutrients that is very, very fast because it's very hot and it is very uh, wet. This is near Jasper National Park in Canada, in Alberta, Canada. So obviously here you're talking about temperature changes. It's very cold. There is a short warm season. And instead of leaves, you have primarily pine needle forests. So these soils tend to be a bit more acidic. Animals can help with soil generation. They burrow into the ground. They create tunnels. Think about rabbits. Think about prairie dogs like this image. And that water can seep in. And it can carry some of that material further down. Topography. If you go to Harriman State Park, this is what you find where the bedrock is really, really, really close to the ground, to the surface rather. Now, topography in a flat area like the state of Iowa, well, there the, the soils are deep and they are rich. And you have to go really far down before you actually get to, to bedrock. Again, the parent material. The deeper you go, the more inorganic it becomes, the higher you are. There are twigs and leaves and roots. Some of them are alive. A lot of them are dead. There's a lot of decomposition and exchange of nutrients. So this is the very rich part of the soil. And it becomes less so as you go further down. The soil forming processes, well, they are these addition, transformation, depletion, and translocation. So let's look at them. Addition is gains made by the soil when organic material is added. Think about that period in the fall when the leaves fall, they eventually get wet, they decompose, and eventually by the time the next spring rolls around, you can't even tell what, that they were there. Sometimes you can, but for the most part, you cannot. Transformation, the weathering of rocks and minerals, and the decomposition of organic material so that you've added leaves, you've transformed them, and then you carry them downward to deeper and deeper layers. So this would be step one, this would be step two, three, and four, okay? And here's an image that kind of shows you those four images, those, these four processes in a very simple little graphic. And here's a look at soils from different areas. This is ice right here. So this is showing you in a place um where i'm sorry this is not ice my bad let me correct that again in a place we had different layers of soil notice the different colors and this is the organic layer here at the very very top in this you have this very almost very poor thick mat of very salty soils very dry very sandy as the word is shown there Again, there's that image again. And the, the, the soils end up sort of layering up into what are called horizons or different layers. So this brown layer here would correspond to this. So this is where or organic and inorganic materials are added. Uh, this layer would be that layer there, this layer would be that one, that layer would be that one. Now, further down, you get to bedrock. And, you know, this is where buildings are usually anchored to, like big, tall 
towers so that they don't fall. You need to anchor them into something solid, especially if you're talking about a very, very, very tall tower. Again, these are three terms right here, eluviation with an E, iluviation with an I, and leaching. There was an earlier image that showed that this is carrying the materials down, and this is where they end up depositing to. Leaching is simply a dissolved nutrients carried down through the soil uh, by, the, by the action of water. Let's see, let's look at basic soil properties. Color is the most obvious. Texture, is it clay? Is it sand? Is it gravel? Get it? Clay is very, very, very small. Um, silt, but then you get to sand and gravel and they get bigger, okay? So color, texture, and structure. And here's the sense of size. So your typical gravel size will be about two millimeters in diameter. Not very big, but sand compared to silt and clay is really, really big, okay? So here's an example of clay 0 0.002 millimeters versus two millimeters. That's a factor of a thousand, okay? Color, I think it's the most obvious feature. The idea of structure, whether they are sort of like columns or plates, or are they blocks of soil? That makes a big difference. It has an impact on construction. It has an impact on uh, the type of housing that you can build. Uh, it affects roads and how they're built and sort of established. Or granular. Soil texture. So here we're talking about the, the idea of porosity and permeability. And something that's porous and permeable means it lets water through versus something that is porous and not permeable would simply get stuck. So sand is porous and permeable. Clay would be porous, but not permeable. So here's the idea, the difference between the two. Again, porosity refers to the percentage of, of pore spaces. So it's a, the volume of the voids, the big gaps, to the total volume. Permeability is just the interconnectedness of all those pore spaces. So the most porous soil taught would be clay, but the most permeable would be gravel. So clay would soak up water, but it doesn't let it pass. Gravel soaks it up and lets it pass, okay? And here are some example types. And this is right out of your textbook, and it is used in one of your homework questions. The idea of the soil, um, triangle so it's a function of you know if you're gonna if you're gonna have something that is 10 percent sand and 90 percent silt then 90 and 10 equals 100 so it would be silt if you have something that is 40 percent silt and 30 percent sand and 30 percent clay it would be clay loam 30 and 40 is 70 and another 30 is 100 percent. so that's how you would add that up okay you need to add up to 100 percent. so in this case it'd be 40 30 30 and right where they meet it would be called a clay loam uh, something that is 80 percent sand 
but 20% clay would be a loamy sand. And so that's how you go about it. The number always has to add up to 100%. As long as you do that, you're good to go. All right. So that's is the lesson for today. Next week, we get into biogeography and actual ecosystems. Uh, if you have any questions, don't forget the live study hour. Uh, for the course, the link is available on the left hand side of the Blackboard page. Uh, if that time doesn't work for you, one can be set up that does. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic week and I will talk to you soon. Bye.